بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي So today, inshallah ta'ala, um, we sit for a continuation of the reading, of the tremendous work that's been titled, well, the, no, the tremendous work, purification of the heart, its diseases and, and its cures, or as the translation has been titled, purification of the heart, its diseases and their cures. And I've been tasked with trying to complete chapters eight and nine. Chapters eight and and nine. Chapter eight being purification of the heart. Al Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. And before beginning, um, this is a lot of material to cover. It's a lot of material. A lot of material to cover, so what we're going to do, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to try to summarize the material from both chapters. So that at least we can go through the entire chapter, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, but in a, in a summarized fashion. So for those who, um, those who are diligent in taking notes, perhaps what you could do is title your notes, um, 10 Benefits Connected to Purifying the Heart. 10 Benefits Connected to, to Purifying the Heart. And for those who have the book, what we'll do is we'll number, we'll, we'll number where those places or those 10, 10 benefits come from. 10 benefits connected to purifying, purifying the heart. And we begin on page number 133. We begin on page number, page number 133, wherein Al-Imam, he mentions that, and again, remember, we're reading in a summarized fashion. And then, you know, uh, at the end of the night or whenever a person has time, then go back and read the entire chapter, inshallah ta'ala. When we look at the middle of page 133, we look at the middle of page 133, where, and we'll entitle this benefit number one. Right? Remember, remember, we mentioned 10 benefits connected to, to purify the heart. Right? Benefit number one, right? Perhaps we can say the importance of leaving sins, right? Because that's the topic of this particular conference, purifying the heart. Benefit number one from these chapters, the importance of, of leaving off sin. If a person wants to purify their heart, one of the things that must be done is that they must leave off sin. Al-Imam Ibn Qayyim, he mentions that the impurity of sins upon the heart is like harmful substances in the body. And no doubt, whoever has been reading this, before we begin, you know, whoever, whoever has been reading this book, they see that the words of Ibn Qayyim are profound, extraordinary, very, very deep. So, you know, I advise myself and I, you know, I advise my brothers and, and, and my sisters, you know, to, to take some time, to take some serious time. Right, to make a cup of tea, a, a glass of water, make some free time, and sit down and ponder these words. You know, while preparing my, my lesson last night and making, going over some notes and things of that, that nature, no doubt this, this book is, 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 is tremendous. It's several moments where I just had to sit back and say, SubhanAllah, I got to rectify my heart. And anyone that comes, anyone that comes across these words, no, no doubt they, they're going to have the same feeling without a shadow of a doubt. You know, if you've been at the conference and you kind of just been muddling through, and the law knows best. I'm not, I'm, no, it's just from, just an alert, not talking about anybody, right? But get into this book, right? We got we to gotta rectify our hearts. The words, it'll bring you to tears in reality. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he mentions... That the impurity of sins upon the heart is like harmful substances in the body, toxins and crops, right? and impurities in gold, silver, copper, and iron. Right? 
The author, Rahimahullah, you know, he's striking a tremendous example of how the sins pollute and, and rust and, and destroy the heart. Similar to harmful substances in the body, toxins in crops, impurities in gold, right? silver, copper, and iron. He mentions, just as when the body expels harmful substances, right, where a person is sick, right, and you begin to heal, right, and the phlegm begins to come out, the mucus begins to come, and all the harmful substances begin to do what? Remove, become, be removed, right? What happens to the body? It starts to get better. That's what I mean. Similar, to, similar with sins in the heart. You got to get rid of the sins in order for the heart to thrive. So he mentioned just as when the body expels harmful substances, its natural strength is restored and becomes comfortable. Right? You become comfortable after being stuffy, right? After having a fever, right? When those things are removed, the natural strength is restored and it become, the body becomes comfortable. And when it becomes comfortable, these words are beautiful. When the body becomes comfortable, so it carries out its duties, right? It carries out the duties that it, that it needs to perform, right? Without hindrance or preventatives in order for the body to develop. And in shorter words, in simpler words, your body heals and you're able to go about carry on as normal. Because when you're sick, you're what? You're down. You can't do anything, right? You're in the bed. You're tired, whatever the case may be. Similar to the heart, when the heart is, is, is polluted with sins, it can't do what it needs to do. It can't do what it needs to do. Meaning, it can't turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that it's supposed to. Because it's sick, sick with sins. So he mentions, likewise, the heart is the same. Likewise, the heart is the same when it is cleansed of sins, right, through repentance. Right? Because we all have shortcomings. Right? And the heart becomes polluted and tainted. Right? But the key to rectification is repentance. It's a person rectify themselves. Right? And sometimes, you know, we mention the word repentance. And, you know, it might sound unattainable or complicated or however a person may take it. But repentance in reality means just change. It's change. We all know ourselves. We all know our vices. Sincerely change. Whatever it may be, stop doing it. Have the firm resolve to never re return to it. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to make this a, a, um, a detailed lecture. No, nobody say what are the conditions of repentance. The, we get that. We understand that, inshallah. But what I'm trying to do is just drive the point home as simple as possible. Just change and stop. Whatever it is that we're doing, stop and change. And rectify and become a better Muslim. If the issue with the prayer, begin to pray properly. If it's the issue with music, stop listening to music. Change. Turn on the Quran. If it's the issue with the opposite sex, get married. Change. And do right. The point that I'm trying to make, that's, that's, that's how you rectify the heart. The author Rahimahullah, he mentions, when it's cleansed of sins through repentance, it purifies itself from the mixture of impurities, restoring the heart's strength and the will to do good. And again, if we ponder, the words are tremendous. They're very simple. When your body heals and, and, and it gets rid of all of the, 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 the ill substances and things of that nature, it returns back to normal and is able to, is able to function properly. The strength returns. A person's heart may become weak, right? We're human beings. 
A person's heart may become weak. I, a person may say, I, you know, I really, I really don't feel like the heart is, I really don't feel like fasting. The heart is weak. It doesn't have the strength to, to, to do it. It doesn't have the strength to do it. You know, I can't get those two in after Maghrib. I can't get those two in before Fajr. The heart is weak. It's sick. It's not strong enough to, to push you to do it. And the author, Rahim Allah, is comparing it to the body. When your body is weak, you just can't, you can't do it. No matter how much you want to get up, no matter how much you want to run, jog, no matter how you want to go to work, you can't do it. You got you down. He mentions it rests. Allahu Akbar. It rests from the corrupt influences and negative elements. And no doubt, those are tremendous words, the heart at rest. Because when the heart is consumed with sins, right, and, 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 and transgressions, and transgressing the bounds, the heart, it can't rest. A person might be full of anxiety. A person might be depression. The heart, it can't rest. When a person rectifies themselves and embarks Upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they find tranquility in the heart. The heart is able to rest. He mentioned it rests from the corrupt influences and negative elements. So it's purified, grows, strengthens. And listen to this beautiful sentence, right? Listen to this beautiful sentence. He mentions about the heart. He mentions about the heart. And it sits on the throne of sovereignty. And it sits on the throne of its sovereignty, executing its authority over its subjects. Who is it? Who, what are its subjects? The limbs. When the heart is right, it sits on its throne of authority and executes the orders to its subjects, meaning the limbs. Who obey its commands. Who obey its commands. So there is no way for the heart to attain purification until it goes through this process. The process of what? We clearing, cleansing it from what? From sins. If we return back, or we missed a benefit, right? We said 10 benefits, right? Connected to purifying the heart. Number one, we mentioned the importance of of leaving sins. And what a person could do, you know, what I did, is you could put that at that paragraph. Put a number one and put it at that paragraph. Just write, just write a title over top of the paragraph. The importance of leaving sins. Then we have benefit number two. We have benefit number two, which was, and I didn't mention it, I slipped my mind, the rightful place of the heart. It's benefit number two, because we want our heart to assume its rightful place. We want our heart to assume its rightful, rightful place, its rightful place of sovereignty, executing its authority over its subjects. And we find that, we find that in a hadith that we, um, that we all know, and I just want to go through it quickly because it's a hadith that we have to be familiar with. How many benefits have we done so far? Two. Right. And this hadith is connected to benefit number two. This hadith is connected to benefit number two, which is the rightful place of, of the heart. And the hadith is found in a hadith of Abi Abdullah and Nu'man ibn Bashir, a hadith that, that we've heard. Call away, he says, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Yaqul. He mentioned the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, In al halal bayin, wa in al haram bayin, wa bayinahuma amurun mushtabihat, la ya'lamu hunna kathiru min al nas, fa min attaqa shubahat. فقد استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كالراعي يرعى حول الحما يوشك أن يرتع فيه ألا وإن لكل مالك حما ألا وإن حما الله محارمه ألا وإن في الجسد مغضة 
idha salahat salah al jasudu kullu wa idha fasadat fasad al jasudu kullu ala wa hiya al qalb hadith that we're all familiar with hadith in bukhari and muslim the hadith that in the that the that which is permissible is what clear and that which is impermissible is what clear right and between them are affairs that are what ambiguous was meant by ambiguous just to make sure we understand the hadith was meant by ambiguous doubtful how do we understand the word doubtful in this hadith ambiguous doubtful how do we understand it you don't have not let me let me ask let me ask a better question does doubt is doubtful the same for everybody good all right just want to make sure that, that that's how you under something what something something might be doubtful for one person and what clear to the other because the person might have an increase in knowledge over the other person and the affair might be what clear right so we want to we don't just make sure we understand the hadith properly Something may be unclear to you when you say, Achi, that's what? Unclear. He says, no, that's not unclear. So to me, that's absolutely what? Clear. Right? So what I'm trying to say is unclear and ambiguous is relative. Right? Just so we make sure we understand the hadith what? Properly. Many of the people do not have knowledge of them. So whoever stays away from, from doubtful matters, right? Whoever stays away from, from doubtful matters, or ambiguous matters right, has protected his religion, right, and his reputation. Has protected his religion and his what? Reputation. And whoever indulges in those ambiguous affairs right, may fall into the what? Haram. Just like a shepherd. Just like a shepherd who has his flock. Grazing near a what? A boundary. Grazing near a boundary. Coming very close to going what? Over it. Every king has his what? It has his what? Sanctuary and boundaries. And the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the things that are what? Impermissible. Right? And I mention this particular hadith because we're talking about staying away from what? Sins. What we learn from this particular hadith is one of the keys to staying away from sins, right? One of the keys from staying away from sins is also to stay away from what? Ambiguous matters. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Why is one of the keys to staying away from sins, staying away from ambiguous matters? We'll see when we mention the benefits of this hadith. Why do you think that? That's a good answer. Something else, though. Following the desires. He's getting, the brother is getting close. It may a person becomes less cautious. You with me? If a person is always delving into or going into ambiguous matters, in reality, what is, what is he removing from his, from, his, from his persona? Caution and care. So that removal of caution and care could, re, could lead to a removal of caution and care of things that are what? Clear. But when a person is staying away from the things that are ambiguous, Right, and the things that are great, he's keep, keeping up the barrier of being what? Being what? Cautious. So he mentions, indeed, in the body there's a morsel of, morsel of flesh. If it's upright, then all of the body will be what? Upright. If it's corrupt, then the rest of the body will be what? Corrupt. And that morsel of flesh is the what? The heart. Going back to what we just mentioned from benefit number two, right? Benefit number two was the rightful place of the heart, right? The rightful place of the heart is that is the what? The king of the what? The limbs. This is a well-known hadith, correct? Well-known hadith, right? Some of the benefits from this hadith, jot down these benefits from this hadith. From the benefits of this hadith, benefit number one is that affairs are, are three categories. Affairs are, are three categories. Affairs are three categories. Affairs in the Sharia, I say it like that. Affairs in the Sharia, affairs in Islamic legislation are three categories. Clearly permissible, clearly impermissible, and ambiguous. Clear, per, clearly permissible, clearly impermissible, and ambiguous. Cool. 
Benefit number two from this hadith. Not from the lesson. Benefit number two from this hadith. Many people do not know the role, many people do not know the ruling on ambiguous affairs. Many people do not know the ruling on ambiguous affairs. However, some people do. However, some people do know the ruling with his proofs. However, some people do know the ruling or the rulings and their proofs. Benefit number three, and put a star next to this one. Benefit number three, and it's good for the heart. Leaving off ambiguous affairs until it is known that it's permissible. Leaving off ambiguous affairs until it's known that it's permissible. For those who are teachers, right, for those who are teachers, right, especially our sisters who teach the children. Benefit number four. Striking tangible examples for things that are abstract. Striking tangible examples for things that are abstract. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam st struck a tangible example of the shepherd with his flock to the person guarding his religion. So striking examples of tangible things for things that are abstract. Benefit number five is what we previously mentioned. That if a person is lax with ambiguous affairs, it may cause them to be lax with things that are clear. If a person is lax as it relates to ambiguous affairs, it may cause them to be lax in things that are things that are clear. And again, if we want to sum it up, if we want to sum it up, a person wants to a person wants to get himself or herself in the habit of being cautious as it relates to their religion. Benefit number six, and this is connected to a direct connection to, to our book, and that is a clarification of the tremendous status of the heart. A clarification of the tremendous status of the heart and that the limbs follow it. Clarification of the tremendous status of the heart and that the limbs, that the limbs follow it. Now, benefit number seven, Allahu Akbar. Benefit number seven is that an out, outward corruption is an indication of inward corruption. Outward corruption is an indication of inward corruption. Meaning if a person is behaving in a corrupt manner outwardly, that's the indication that his heart is what? Corrupt. Now, <clears throat> back to page number 134, inshallah. Back to page number, back to page number 134, benefit number three. Benefit number three, as it relates to purifying the heart. Benefit number three, as it relates to purifying. Remember those benefits that we just mentioned were benefits connected to the hadith of the Nurman. Benefit number three, connected to our lesson, connected to ten benefits, connected to purification of the heart. Benefit number three is the benefits of lowering the gaze. A person wants to purify their heart from sin and to cleanse their heart. One of the ways to do so is to be strong and consistent and firm and lowering the gaze. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, Kullil mu'mineen yagudhu min abasarihim wa yahfudhu furujahum thalika azka lahum inna allaha khabirun bima yasna'oon 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, tell the believing men and women to lower their gaze. Benefit number three for purifying the heart and cleansing it from sin is to lower the gaze. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and guard their private parts and guard their private parts. That is pure for them. That's the point of reference. Highlight that. Because we're talking about what? Purification of the heart. That's the point of reference right there. That is purer for them. Lowering the gaze leads to purification of the heart. Indeed, Allah is all aware of what they do. Indeed, Allah is all aware of what they do. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions that in this verse, Allah has declared that purification occurs after lowering the gaze and guarding one's private parts. Right, so add to that benefit, add to that benefit. I said benefit number three, um, benefits of lowering the gaze and guarding the private parts. Add that to that. Number three, the third benefit of being able to, or that aids in purifying the heart, is lowering the gaze and guarding the private parts. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions that, hence, Lowering the gaze from forbidden things entails three great and significant benefits, right? So a person lowers their gaze, right? A person lowers their gaze. There are three benefits that are going to be mentioned from the person who lowers their gaze, right? Generally speaking, lowering the gaze is going to do what? Generally speaking, lowering the gaze is going to do what? Purify the heart, right? Side note, there are benefits from lowering the gaze, right? The general benefit that we want to take from it is that it's going to purify the heart, but there's some other benefits that we're going to see from a person lowering their gaze. Number one, number one, the sweetness and pleasure of faith. The sweetness and pleasure of faith. Which is sweeter, more delightful, and more enjoyable than what one turns their gaze away from and leaves for the sake of Allah. And one of, the things, one of the things that we'll mention, inshallah ta'ala, after Maghrib is that one of the blessings, I'm mentioning now because we may not live to after Maghrib. It's the reality, right? It's the reality. We could perish at any moment. And no doubt that helps to purify the heart as well, realizing that we could perish at any moment. We don't know if we're going to have this second class after Maghrib. It's not a given. That's the reality. But one of the benefits that we wanted to mention, inshallah ta'ala, after Maghrib, is that Ali, Imam Ibn Qayyim, he's mentioned right here, the sweetness and pleasure of faith. We have to understand that the sweetness and pleasure of faith, right, is a blessing that we may not realize. It's the biggest blessing that we have, being a Muslim and being a believer. And being able to taste the sweetness of faith. Why am I saying that? It's a tremendous blessing because it's not connected to the, it's for, it's for the believer. The sweetness of faith is for the believer only. Meaning, when a person finishes the prayer, right? When you finish your prayer, right? You pray all day, you pray all five prayers. How you feel at the end of the day? How you feel? Great. Prayed all my prayers on time. Alhamdulillah, prayed them in the master. Prayed my sunnah prayers. How do you feel? That's for who? Who's that feeling for? The believer. It's called the sweetness of faith. It's a blessing. You cannot buy it. You can't buy it. It doesn't matter how much money a non-Muslim have. They cannot buy that. They can't buy it. When you finish up Umrah and you shave your hair, how do you feel? Amazing, what my brother said. You cannot, you cannot buy it. What's that called? It's called the sweetness of what? Faith. And that's for who? The believer. That means that you could be penniless and be what? A believer and what else? Happy. You could be penniless and you can be happy. 
That's a favor for who? The believer. It's connected to the heart. It's called the sweetness of faith. And realize that that is a tremendous blessing. Realize that's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous blessing. Because as we're, we're going to discuss, inshallah ta'ala, after Maghrib, that there's something that the, the disbeliever doesn't have. Their happiness is connected to things that are tangible. That's why when those things disappear, you see them plummet into depression. Whereas though you can see a believer, where you can see a believer that doesn't have much, and his disposition is a disposition of pleasure, delight, and happiness as if he has all of the world. Because residing in his heart is the sweetness of what? Faith. Realize, realize the blessing of being a believer. Realize the blessing of Islam. From the benefits of lowering the gaze is the sweetness and pleasure of faith. It's the sweetness and pleasure of faith. Again, practically speaking, right? Something comes goes past, or you see something, right? And it's an impermissible look, and you don't look, right? You don't look. It goes past, and you say, "I'm not what? I'm not looking." After whatever it is goes past, how do you feel? Say, "Alhamdulillah, I ain't look." It's from the benefits of lowering the gaze that you taste the sweetness of what? Faith. Whereas though when you look and you stare, it causes what to the heart? Distress. It's going to pollute the heart because you looked at something that you shouldn't look at, and it might cause stress, as Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim is going to mention. Because you might look at something and you can't what? You can't have it. You might look at something that's impermissible and you can't have that. And now it's going to torture your heart. So he mentions the sweetness and pleasure of faith, which is sweeter, more delightful, and more enjoyable than what one turns their gaze away from and leaves for the sake of Allah. Whatever that was, whatever that was, what, it wasn't better, it's not going to be better than the taste and the sweetness of what? Faith. Just let it go. And Allah is going to replace it with that which is what? Better. So the author, Rahimahullah, he mentions on the bottom of page 134, he mentions, for whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will compensate them with something better. The soul has a burning sensation for the love of looking at beautiful images. And the eye is a surveyor of the heart. The eyes are the surveyor of, of what? The heart. It sends it to see what's out there. If it informs the heart of the beauty and attractiveness of what it has seen, it triggers a longing for it. You have brother has a sit down. He gets his legislated look. He's a legislated look, and the woman is absolutely what? Beautiful. MashaAllah. What you saw in your eyes go straight where? To your heart. I'm marrying her. <laughs> and at that point, it's, it's going to take something very serious to do what? To stop you. Because what you saw went right into your what? Your heart. But the, the thing is, imagine if that happens with something that's impermissible. It goes into your heart like that and it's impermissible. And you get that fervent desire to have it because I'm laying it in your heart now. The other situation is cool. You're just going to put everything together and go ahead and get married. You're going to work extra hard, put everything in place, you're gonna, and you're going to go ahead and get married. That's cool. But imagine if it's the opposite and you start putting stuff together. So 
So he mentions it sends what it sees out there and it informs the heart of the beauty and attractiveness of what it has seen. It triggers a longing for it, a desire for it. From the benefits of lowering the gaze that you don't have to what? You have to go through that. You taste the sweetness of faith and whatever it was, the law gives you something that's even more what? Beautiful. Yet often, the sender and the surveyor become exhausted. The sender and the surveyor become exhausted. As it was said, when you sent your sight as a surveyor for your heart, which you saw caused exhaustion. Meaning you saw it and you can't have it and now you're going through it because you can't have it. You're exhausted mentally. You're exhausted mentally. You can't have it. You saw things with, that you are unable to fully acquire. You saw things which you are unable to fully acquire. But listen to the last line. Nor can you refrain from having a small portion of it. You can't fully have it, so you might go do something you ain't supposed to do. Just to get a small what? Small portion of it. So you saw something that you couldn't fully acquire, right? Nor, nor, because of what it did to your heart, nor can you refrain of having a small what? Portion. All because you did what? All because you didn't do what? Didn't lower our gaze. When the surveyor, when the surveyor stops exploring, meaning you stop looking, or meaning we stop looking, right? When the surveyor stops exploring, the heart rests. Again, the heart resting. You're not looking, you don't have anything to stir those emotions and desire, you don't have it. You're not looking at anything. So the heart gets a chance to do what? Rest and focus on what? Focus on what? The obedience to Allah, worshiping Allah. The heart rests. Whoever allows their thoughts to flow without restraint will experience long-lasting regret. And if we, we look at page 135, when we look at page 135, we'll summarize it, right? The perils of the look, right? The perils of the look. What happens, right? What happens is a person looks at something, write this down. It's per, the, 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 the perils, the, 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 what am I trying to say? The, the, the destruction that, that follows after the look. Number one is what? You, you love that thing. You look at it and then you do what? You love it. And then after that, it becomes a what? An intense love. Right, that's number two. Right, it's the stages. The stages of peril. That's what I'm trying to say. The stages of peril. You look at it, and you stare at it, it becomes love. Then it becomes an intense love. That's number two. Number three, then a person becomes attached. Number three, the next, next step is being attached. And it's in paragraph one, it's in the bottom of page 135, I just numbered them. After being attached, number four becomes an obsession. When a person just can't stop, then they become obsessed. Can't stop talking about it, can't stop thinking about it, can't, just can't stop. Then it enters into the depths of the heart. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions it strengthens even more and it could cause a person to be in a state of worship. It's number six.
We move to page number 136. We move to page number 136, and we're still on benefit number three, benefits of lowering the gaze, benefits of lowering the gaze and protecting the private area. He mentions all of this is a product, all of this is a product of the unlawful gaze. All of this is a product of the unlawful gaze. SubhanAllah. Consequently, author Rahimahullah, he mentions consequently, consequently, the heart becomes a prisoner after it was a king. Because we already mentioned in the previous hadith, the heart is the what? The king. And it tells the limbs what? What to do. The unlawful gaze can cause the heart to become a prisoner after having been the what? The king. The heart, the heart is imprisoned to this thing that it looked at. Consequently, the heart becomes a prisoner after it was a king, imprisoned after it was free. Complaining from the wrongs of the sight. Complaining about the eyes. The heart begins to complain about the eyes. While the eyes, they say, I am your surveyor and your messenger. And you are the one who did what? Sent me out. Benefit number two from lowering the gaze. Right, benefit number one from lowering the gaze was the sweetness and pleasure of, of faith. Benefit number two of lowering the gaze. Benefit number two of lowering the gaze is that it brings light to the heart and clarity of insight. I mean, a person who's able to lower their gaze, they will be blessed with insight. I Meaning seeing things how they're, suppo how they're supposed to be seen. You know, perhaps, and perhaps a simple example is a person who, you know, a person who stares at, at women, for example, right? Or a woman who stares at men, right? Just stares, 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 and stares. They lose their insight, right? And just a simple example, right? And they begin, to, they begin to look at women as if it's what? Nothing. You with me? Especially if it's anonymous. They look at women like it's what? Nothing. They just look at them. And they lost their what? They lost their insight, right? Where they lost the insight to say, this is what? SubhanAllah, this is going to lead to a lot of what? A lot of harm. They don't have that insight anymore. As for the believer, no matter the grace of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we understand lowering our what? Gaze is something that we need to do. So by the grace of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've been blessed with insight to understand that that's what? Wrong. By the grace of Allah, we've been able, we understand that, that that's wrong. Even if a person makes a mistake, they say, what? Stuck for Allah. It's and then they say, may Allah forgive me. They still have the insight to have to do what? Seek what? Repentance. That's from the benefits of lowering the gaze. From the benefits of lowering the gaze is that a person is, is blessed with what? With insight. And a person who lets their eyesight just run rampant, they, they, begin to, they, they begin to lose the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. They lose their insight. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions this statement of Abu Shuja al-Kirmani. Where he said, whoever dedicates his outward appearance to following the sunnah, whoever dedicates his outward appearance to following the sunnah, his inward self to constant mindfulness, restrains himself from desires. Point of reference right here, lowers his gaze from what is forbidden. That's the point of reference. Lowers his gaze from what is forbidden and habitually consumes halal sustenance. He will never be wrong in his discernment. I mean, this person is doing what? Being what? Upright and righteous. So he's going to be given what? Discernment. Able to, able to, able to, function, pro able to function properly religiously. That's what's meant by that. Able to make the correct religious decisions. The correct decisions connected to their, to, their, to their religion and their religiosity. Due to the fact that they're striving. Allah has mentioned the story of the people of Lut and the trials they face. 
and the trials they face. And it was said afterwards, Inna fi dhalika la ayatin lil mutawassimin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Indeed, in it for signs are signs for those who discern. Indeed, in that are signs for those who, who discern, right? who have sound judgment. They are those who possess sound judgment and abstained. What was the situation with the people of Lut? They abstained from doing what? Looking at what was forbidden and what? Shameful. So as a result of that, they, had, they were given what? Discernment and insight from the benefits of lowering the gaze. There's some other things that are said, but let's look at benefit number three. Benefit number three as it relates to, as it relates to lowering the gaze. Benefit number three as it relates to, as it relates to lowering the gaze. Benefit number three of lowering the gaze is that the heart, it gains strength, steadfastness, and courage. Benefit number three of lowering the gaze is that the heart, it gains strength, steadfastness, and courage. Now, just to make sure everybody's with me, what are the three benefits of, of lowering the gaze? Number one is what? Sweetness of faith. Number two? Huh? Granted, granted light or insight. Right? Number three, the heart is granted what? Strength and what? Courage. Now, in a nutshell. We look at the bottom of page 138, the last sentence on the bottom of page 138. It mentions... Hence, you will find the one who follows his desires has a soul that is humiliated and weak, right? Hence, you find the one who follows his desires has a soul that is humiliated and weak. And it is the humiliation that Allah prescribes upon those who disobey him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, and to Allah belongs all honor, and to his messenger, and to the believers. The point of this ayah being mentioned, right, and to Allah belongs all honor, and to his messenger, and to the believers, meaning that honor, right, honor, and courage, and strength, they're attained by obeying Allah and his messenger. Everybody with me? In disobedience, the, the end result for disobedience is what? Humiliation. Allah the Most High, he says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, so do not become weak. And do not grieve. You will be superior if you are true believers. Be superior if you are what? True believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, مَنْ كَانُ يُرِيدُ الْعِزَّةَ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, whoever desires honor, whoever desires honor, then to Allah belongs all honor. What's meant by these verses, what's meant by these verses is that in other words, in other words, whoever seeks honor, right, they should seek it through the obedience of Allah or obedience to Allah with good speech and righteous deeds. Whoever wants to receive honor and strength and courage, whoever wants those praiseworthy characteristics, then they're achieved by being obedient to Allah who's subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in a point of reference, from that obedience to Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala is lowering the gaze. From that obedience to Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala is lowering the gaze. Now, 
9. Rehash before we move to chapter number 9 because we have to cover chapters number 8 and chapters number number 9. Now, so we mentioned, so we mentioned, right? What we want to try to do today, inshallah, is cover 10 benefits connected to purifying the what? The heart. Right? I just want to rehash before we move on to the next chapter. Right, because again, as you know, as we always mention, especially in our classes, all of, you know, just our, the goal is we want to try to make sure that we that we retain the information, that we retain it. Number one, that we understand it, that is that is that is solid, that we retain it, and that we implement it. Right, that's the goal. Right, so we meant, wanted to mention ten benefits connected to purifying the heart. Right, we mentioned number one, the first benefit if we want to pure first way or benefit to purify our heart is to, to understand the importance of leaving off what, leaving off sin. That's number one. Inshallah ta'ala, everybody is here to try to purify their hearts. Number one, we want, to st- we want to leave off, we want to leave off sin. Right, that was number one. Number two is that we want to understand in order to purify our hearts, we need to understand that it's right for what? It's right for place. And we need to understand that our heart is the what? The king. And it, does, and it, and it controls all of the other, all of the other limbs. That's number two. Number three, if we want to purify our hearts, we need to understand that Part of, or one of the things that's going to help us purify our hearts is to lower the gaze. Right. Want to work on purifying our hearts? We have to lower the gaze. Right. And there are benefits to lowering the gaze. There are benefits to lower to, lowering the gaze. From those benefits is that we will taste the sweetness of faith. Right. We will taste the sweetness of faith. Right. Benefit number two is that we will be given insight, meaning able to see things for what they really are able to see the true reality of things from the benefits of lowering the gaze. We don't lower the gaze, we may lose our insight. And we mentioned an example. Benefit number three of lowering the gaze right, is we gain strength, steadfastness, and courage, courage of the heart. Chapter number nine, page 151. Chapter number nine, page, page one. And again, after, after, after looking at this chapter in a summarized manner, inshallah ta'ala, read it in a detailed manner and increase, increase in benefit. Chapter number nine. Chapter number nine, cleansing the heart from impurities and filth. Chapter number nine, cleansing the heart from impurities and filth. Benefit number four, benefit number four if, we want to clear, if we want to purify our hearts. Benefit number four, in order to connect it to F1. Benefit number four, connect it to purifying the hearts. Is the explanation of Surah Al-Mudathir. Pondering, or we can say pondering the explanation of Surah Al-Mudathir. Benefit number four, or way number four, in order to purify our hearts is to ponder the tafsir of the beginning of Surah Al-Mudathir. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, Ya ayyuha al-mudathir, kum fa'anthir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahir. Right, that's the point of reference. O you... Enveloped in garments, arise and warn, arise and warn. And no doubt a, 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 a benefit in, in, in Minhaj is that no doubt this verse is a proof for the methodology of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah of warning against innovation. Arise and what? Warn. Right. So no doubt it's from the methodology, that's from the methodology of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah to warn from shirk and bid'ah. Arise and warn. And your Lord glorify. And your garments purify. That's the point of reference. Highlight that right there. And your and your garments purify. And your garments purify. Right, three explanations for that verse. We have three, three explanations for that verse. Three explanations for that verse. 
and your, and your garments purified. Explanation number one, right? We'll summarize it. Explanation number one. Thiab, wa thiab, bekef tahir. Was meant by thiab, right? Was meant by thiab. Is an expression that means the soul, meaning purify your soul. Right? Thiab right here, meaning what? The soul. Right? That's, that's explanation number one. Right? That's explanation number one. And your garments, or better, better yet, right here, better yet, to make it even clearer, go back to page 151, it says, and your garments. I keep saying thiab, right? The translation is, and your garments. Garment right here, meaning heart or soul. That's what's meant by garment. And your heart or soul, purify it. That's what's meant by garment right here. What's meant by garment right here is heart or soul. And your garments purify, meaning your heart and your soul, purify it. That's explanation number one. Therefore, clothing or garment, yani thiab, is an expression that means the soul. And it was a custom of the Arabs to use clothing to refer to the soul. It was a custom of the Arabs to use clothing to refer to the soul. Right? And on page, you read pages 152 and thereafter to see the examples of the Arabs doing such. But the point being, the point being is that the Arabs, they would use the word garment and your garment purified, right, from the... From the the way from the, the customs of the Arab is to use the word garment to mean to mean what heart or or soul. And your garment meaning your heart or your soul purified. That's explanation number one. Flip to page one fifty five. Explanation number two. Explanation number two. Top of page one fifty five. Explanation number two. Some scholars interpreted this verse according to its literal meaning saying that it commands the purification of one's garment from the impurities that invalidate the prayer. Right? That's the second meaning of the verse. Right? Side, side note. Right? Nice benefit. And your garments purify, meaning really, meaning really your what? Your garments. Mean garment meaning what? Garment. Right? Meaning purify your garments from the things that would invalidate the what? The prayer. So in the second explanation, garment really means what? Garment. The first explanation, garment meant what? Heart. And there are examples of the Arab using that word, using the word thiab to actually mean what? The soul. Explanation number three. This is a nice explanation, right? This is a subtle explanation. Meaning, and your gar garment shortened them. What the yad beka fatahir meaning, and your garment shortened them, meaning wear them above your what? Ankle. Meaning, Shortening the garment causes it to be further away from impurities because it says what? And your garments do what? Purify them, right? And if they're shortened, then that's the way to do what? Purify them because if they're dragging on the ground, they may pick up what? Filth. So one of the explanations is that this verse is used as a proof in order to wear the pants above the what? Ankles. Shortening the garment causes it to be further away from impurities. And if it were to trail on the ground, it cannot be guaranteed that it will not come into contact with something that may soil it. Now, flip to page 159. Benefit number five, if we want to purify our hearts, right? If we want to purify our hearts, a pure heart loves the Quran. Pure heart loves the Quran. A person wants to purify their heart and rectify their heart, be connected to the Quran. The top of page 159. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentioned, he mentioned, the purified heart, the purified heart due to its excellent light, F F1, due to its excellence, the purified heart due to its excellence, light, in the absence of impurities of filth within, is never tired of the Quran. We know the heart is pure. We know the heart is purifying, right, when it's never tired of the Quran. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions, it is not nourished by anything other than its truths. Allahu Akbar, nor is it healed by any other remedy. A person, person's heart is suffering, 
right? The remedy is the Quran, nor is it healed by any other remedy. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions, in contrast, the heart that Allah has not purified, the heart that Allah has not purified feeds on whatever suits it. Feeds on whatever suits it. According to the impurity it contains. SubhanAllah, we really got, listen to this last sentence, put a star next to it. Right? I'm, I'm saying, right? I'm saying put a star next to it because we let's, want to test ourselves. I want to test, we want to test ourselves, right? An impure heart is like a sick body, right? An impure heart is like a sick body. It cannot tolerate the intake that a healthy body can. Why is that being mentioned? Why is that being mentioned? A sick body, if you're trying to eat, right? A sick body, if you're trying to eat, if you're sick, you might do what? You might vomit. So if your heart is sick, it can't tolerate the what? The Quran. It can't intake it because it's sick. Right? And that's a, that's, that's, that's a test for who? Ourselves. Can you tolerate the Quran? Because a healthy heart never what? Never gets tired. Point number five, point number, point number five. A pure heart loves the Quran. A pure heart loves the Quran. Point number six, or benefit number six, connected to purifying the heart. Connected to purifying the heart. It's to know that there are two types of purity. To know that there are two types. There are two types of purity. There are two types of purity. The author, Rahimahullah, mentions at the bottom of page 161, there are two types of purity. There are two types of a purity. The purity of the body and the purity of the heart. There are two types of purity. The purity of the body and the purity, the purity of the heart. That is why it's legislated for the one performing evolution or legislated for the one performing wudu to say after wudu, I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship and truth except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his, and his messenger. Oh Allah, make me from the repentant. That's number one. Put a one next to that. That's pure, make me from the repentant. That's purification of the what? The heart or the soul. Make me from the repentant. That's purification of the soul and the heart. And make me among the purified. That's purification of the what? The body and the limbs and the clothing. So purification is two types. Understand that purification is, is two types. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions here, purity of the heart is achieved through repentance. And we already mentioned that. A person wants to, a person wants to rectify their heart and purify their heart, begin with repentance. You need to change, change your ways. And purity, purity of the body, body is achieved through water. Listen to this beautiful sentence, beautiful book, beautiful book. When these two purifications are combined, purification of the heart, right, and purification of the, of the body and the, and the clothing and things of that nature, when they're both combined, now one, become, one becomes suitable for approaching Allah, standing before him and engaging in supplication after both of the purifications, the heart and, and the physical. Then it's suitable for a person to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, engaging him in supplication. Just flip to page number 171. Flip to page number, number 171. Benefit number seven. Connected to purification of the heart. A beautiful fruit, a beautiful fruit of righteousness. Right? Nice, subtle, nice subtle benefit. Right? Beautiful subtle benefits. Works of the scholars are, are tremendous. Then to this benefit connected to, connected to a pure heart. It even becomes evident in a person's sweat. Listen to this, right? Righteousness and obedience 
it even becomes evident in a person's sweat to the point that their sweat has a foul odor. I mean, a person who's what? Disobedient. That their sweat has a foul odor. Because the impurity of the heart and the soul, right, the impurity in the, of the heart and the soul has a connection to the inner part of the body more than the what? Outer part. And sweat originates from where? Within. So the foulness that's within the heart and the soul, that's within. And sweat originates from within. So the foulness and the wretchedness from the disobedience and transgression, it emanates in the what? The sweat. So a person has a foul odor with their sweat. Due to what? Just on sins and disobedience. This is why a righteous person has pleasant smelling sweat. This is why a righteous person has pleasant smelling sweat. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the most pleasant, pleasant smelling sweat. When Umm Sulaim collected the sweat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked her about her action. He asked her about her action. And she said, it is the best of sense. He asked her about her actions, collecting the sweat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, it is the best of sins. The benefits of a pure heart, the subtle benefits of the pure heart, pleasant smelling sweat. Benefit number eight. If we want to purify our hearts, we have to have reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Benefit number eight. If we want to purify our hearts, then we have to have reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We look at the top of page 173. The author, rahimahullah. Nah. The author, rahimahullah, he mentions... Allah informed us, Allah informed us that the polytheists did not estimate his true worth in three instances in his book. And how can they estimate his true worth when they assign rivals to Allah, whom they love, fear, hope in, humble themselves before, obey, seek refuge from, and prefer to please? And that, that's, that's, tr that's tremendous. Underline, underline that last part, prefer to please. It's going to pollute the heart. It's going to pollute the heart. Preferring to please people over who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to pollute the heart. <coughs> Allah the exalted, he said, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ And the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and among the people are those who take other than Allah as equals to him. They love them as they should love Allah. They love them as they should love Allah. It's going to pollute the heart. But rather, if we want to purify our hearts, we have to understand the importance of the reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Alhamdulillahilladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard wa ja'ala dhulumati wal nur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah, who created the heavens and the earth and originated the darkness and light. Then those who disbelieve equate others to their Lord. They didn't have the proper what? Reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning they associate partners with him in worship, love, and reverence. It's going to pollute the heart. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions, this is the equating that the polytheists committed between Allah and their deities. 
But in the hellfire, they will recognize that it was plain misguidance and falsehood. And they will say to their deities while in the fire with them, Tallahi, in kunna lafi dalalim mubin, idnu sawi kum bi rabbil alameen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, by Allah, we were indeed in manifest error when we equated you with the Lord of the worlds. The author, rahimahullah, he mentions, it is known, right, about the polytheists. It is known that they did not equate them in terms of essence, attributes, or actions. Nor did they say their deities created the heavens and the earth or that they gave life and caused death. They didn't say that. Rather, they equated them in their love for them and their reverence for them and their worship of them as can be observed among people who practice polytheism that ascribe themselves to, to Islam. Al-Muhim, what we're trying to say in point number eight is that in order to purify the heart, we have to have reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, 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 and strive to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over everything else. Point number nine, in purifying the heart or benefits connected to purifying the heart is knowing the status of the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Knowing the status of the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions at the bottom of page 177. Similarly, you will never find an innovator who does not disparage the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if he claims to exalt him through his innovation, since he is claiming that his innovation is more fitting than the actual sunnah. Person practicing innovation, in reality he's claiming that his innovation is more fitting than the actual sunnah. And ponder these, ponder these, these precise words by Ibn Qayyim, he mentions that he may claim that his sunnah itself, if he is ignorant, is an ignorant blind follower. Ignorant blind follower might really think that innovation is actually what? Sunnah. Because they're ignorant. Right? That's category number one. Right? Category number two, but if he has some insight to his innovation, person has learned, they have some insight into the innovation, then he is directly opposing Allah and his messenger. Because they know what they're doing. They're not blind following. But if he has some insight into his innovation, then he is directly opposing Allah, Allah and his messenger. Last point, point number 10. Point number 10, if we want to purify our hearts, right, benefits connected to purifying the heart is understanding the great benefit of Tawheed. Understanding the great benefit, the great benefit of Tawheed. Understand the great benefit of Tawheed. And the status of a monotheist, the status of a muwahid. If a monotheist who has not associated anything with Allah, why not associate anything with Allah, were to meet his Lord with sins equal to the size of the earth? But he's a what? Muwahid. Right. To help us purify our hearts. Were to meet his Lord with sins equal <clears throat> to the size of the earth, Allah will forgive him. Allah will forgive him. But this does not apply to those who contaminate their actions with polytheism. It doesn't matter what act they do. It doesn't matter what they do. They're contaminated and polluted with what? With what? Polytheism and shirk. Pure monotheism, free from any association of partners, does not allow sin to remain. Allah Akbar. Does not allow sin to remain. As it necessitates that the love, reverence, glorification, fear, and hope in Allah will be a means to cleanse the sins. Even if they were as abundant as the size of the earth. Hence, this type of impurity is a temporary condition, meaning the sins. The sins are what? Temporary condition. But it's repellent. What's this repellent? What's meant by the repellent right here? 
Tohid. But it's repellent. It's more powerful, so it cannot remain in the sense. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop there and pick back up after Maghrib. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa